For many boa keepers, their ultimate goal is to breed these beautiful animals and thus ensure that they will continue to be available in captivity. Today I want to give you a very high level overview of the general procedures I use in breeding boa constrictors. I'm Brian from Brian Boas. I'm a breeder of boa constrictors. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel for more videos on all aspects of keeping and breeding boas in captivity. So I thought I'd get out this Suriname female. This is a five-year-old animal, the whole back. I'm not going to be talking about Surinams, but I figured it'd give you guys something nice to look at while I'm talking. To be successful breeding boas, the first thing that you need to worry about is having breeder animals that are ready to breed. And one of the main considerations and questions is how old do they need to be? Well, in general, boas typically will be about four to five years of age before that they can breed. Um, I grow my boas relatively slowly, so they get about one meal every other week for the first two or three years, then they go to about once every three weeks until they reach adulthood and then they're at about once a month. So given this feeding regimen, typically for most of my locality boas, they reach adulthood um, or breeding size for males at about four to four and a half years. Females is about five to five and a half years. Um, the youngest I bred is about a year younger, male about um, three and a half years, female about four and a half years. This girl is a 2015, no, oh, I'm sorry, 2014 baby. So right now she's about five and a half years. So I'm not going to breed her this year. This would probably be the minimum age I would consider breeding. Um, for her, I want her to get a little bit bigger um, before I give her. I breed her for the first time. In general, the age of the boa seems to be more important than the size. We've all heard about boas which have been power fed and fed every week or even twice a week to get them up to a breeding size in about two years or so. But in the long run, this animal uh, that's fed this fast doesn't really do that well and they typically aren't very successful breeders and don't live very long. So what you're looking for is an animal that has a lot of muscle mass. As the animals mature, they get more muscular. You want an animal that's gonna be able to give birth and has the required musculature to do this. And of course, I can't forget to mention that you need a male and a female. I mean, this seems pretty obvious, but it's not that uncommon that people have animals which are missexed and they're trying to breed either two males or two females together, which of course isn't going to work. So make sure you have a pair, a male and a female, if you want to be successful breeding boas. So once you have a pair that's ready to breed, the next step is cycling. And everybody does the cycling a little bit differently. As I mentioned, some people don't drop the temperatures at all. Some people drop it for a longer time, you know, up to two to three months. I'm somewhere in between. I drop the temperatures, I keep the low temperature for a few weeks, and then I go back up to the normal temperatures. So the way that I do it is that starting around early to mid-November, I stop feeding the animals. And then late November, I start to drop the temperatures only at night. So typically I'll drop by two to three degrees Fahrenheit um, at night between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. And every four or five days, I drop it another two to three degrees Fahrenheit. I want to get a total temperature drop at night of about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. This is, I'm referring to the hot spot. So my cage temperatures before the drop, I have a hot spot of 88 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The cool side of the cage or tub is typically 75 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the ambient room temperature is typically 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So after dropping the temperature for a few weeks, I get to the low, which as I mentioned, um, is about 15 degrees or so below the daytime temperature. The hot spot will be about 75. And um, it's really important to check the temperatures carefully. So I highly recommend one of these temperature guns. When you have thermostats maintaining your hot spot, 
depending on what your thermostat is set, it might not be what the actual temperature is. Typically, you have to set the thermostats quite a bit higher to get the hot spot the desired temperature. And I'll touch on thermostats in an upcoming video. But these guns are a very good way of determining your exact hot spot temperature. Okay, so as I mentioned, I keep the temperature um, down at 15 degrees below the normal for about three or four weeks. And then I increase the temperatures in reverse. I just increase the temperatures by two degrees Fahrenheit every four to five days or so until I'm back at the 88 to 90 degree hot spot. I just want to emphasize that for me, I do the temperature drop at night from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. During the day, the hot spot is at 88 to 90 degrees, the same as normal. And some people will do no temperature drop at all. Some people will do the temperature drop 24 hours a day. But I found that the nighttime temperature drop works the best for me. So once I reach the low temperature of about 15 degrees below normal, I'll start to pair animals up. And this is usually in late December or early January. Typically, I'll bring the female to the male's cage, so the male is used to that environment and hopefully will start to court the female. Um, my approach at that point is pretty hands-off. So you can do a lot to get your animals healthy and to get them ready for breeding and to pick compatible animals. But once you put them together, it's really up to them. You can't really make them mate. They have to be interested in each other. Sometimes I see very quick activity, the male is instantly interested in the female and starts to court her and try to mate with her. Other times, the male doesn't really show any interest. But typically, I just leave them together. I let them do their thing. Um, typically, I, I don't check on them more than once a day or so, just so that they can have some privacy and we can let nature do its course. Once I pair up the animals, I usually leave them together for about four weeks. I'll let them do their thing. And at the end of this time period, I'll separate them and give them a small meal. This is about one to two sizes below they normally get in terms of the rodent size. After a week post feeding, I'll put them together again. I'll keep them together for another three to four weeks and then feed them again, wait a week, etc. And I'll repeat this for several months going into the spring until the animals appear to be gravid. So how do I know if a female is gravid? Well, typically the females will be coiled in a tight coil above the hot spot. They're trying to conserve heat for their developing offspring. Often they'll change to a darker color and typically the male will no longer show any interest in mating with the female at this point. And typically, I'll see the animals become gravid anywhere from about April through about June. My BCI localities like the Tar Humaras and the Hog Islands are typically gravid at an earlier time than the BCCs. BCCs often, I don't see them gravid until June or even early July. So I'll look for a shed, which is known as the post-ovulation shed. And it's really important that you make careful notes of the exact date that your female sheds. Typically, the baby boas are born anywhere from about 100 to about 120 days after this shed. Uh, typically for BCI localities, the dwarf boas is closer to about 100 days. For the BCC localities, the females will give birth about 120 days after the post-ovulation shed. And this can vary by several weeks in each, either direction. So you don't get overly concerned if your female hasn't given birth at the time, but it gives you a pretty good idea of when to expect the babies. So I thought I'd change up the snakes. So this is a 2015 holdback Peruvian female. And I imagine she'll be ready to breed in about another year or two. The last thing I wanted to mention about the post ovulation sheds is that Sometimes an animal will have a second shed halfway through the gestation. And this can make it sometimes confusing as to which one was the post-ovulation shed. I've had females that I thought had the post-ovulation shed and I based my due date off of that first shed. But then it comes and goes and weeks later, 
I conclude that the actual post ovulation shed was that second shed. Sometimes, however, the second shed is not the post ovulation shed, so it just varies. Probably around maybe 5 or 10% of the females will have the second shed that's not the post ovulation shed. In addition, a small percentage, probably about 5% or so, will not have a shed at all. And so in this case, you don't really know exactly when to expect the female to give birth. You just have to pay close attention um, if she's going to go into labor. One point I want to mention is that when the females are gravid, I increase the temperature slightly. The hot spot is typically about 92 to 94 degrees. And that's why it's really important to have this heat gun so you can tell exactly what the temperature is, not what your thermostat is reading. And I'll also, I'll temperature gun the female. I want the female typically to be about 88 to 90 degrees. So she's a nice warm temperature to make sure those babies cooking inside are gonna do really well. So as your female's due date gets closer, there's a few things you should keep an eye out for that will let you know that your female is about to give birth. So the first is called the waxy stool. And this happens about a week to several days before the female gives birth. Basically, it's a defecation that looks kind of plasticky looking. Um, the female's basically clearing herself out prior to the babies coming out. I don't, off, I don't always see this waxy stool. Often, I'll only see it after the female's given birth because it's buried in the litter. But if you see this, this is something that tells you your female's about ready to give birth. And then the other thing to look for is that about a day or two prior to giving birth, the females become much more active. You'll see your female cruising around the cage, pushing through the litter, basically looking for a site for the babies to be born in. And when you see this, you know that your female is about ready to give birth. I usually don't see the females give birth. Often it happens at night or early in the morning, but sometimes it happens in the middle of the day and I can actually watch the process. And this process typically takes about an hour to about you know, five or six hours, depending on how many babies the female has and whether or not there are these slugs or unfertilized embryos, which take longer to pass. So once I'm sure the female has finished uh, giving birth, I remove her. I put her in a tub of warm water just to give her a soak and clean her up. And then I put her back in a fresh cage with fresh uh, substrate. I want to remove all of the smell of the babies. Um, so and that's what makes the females a little aggressive when they smell the babies and they want to be protective of those babies. So I want to remove that smell from the female so she can go back to normal. At that point, I remove the babies into a separate tub as well. I'll cover uh, the care of the babies in a upcoming video. So this is about what I wanted to cover in this video. The last thing I'll say is that I typically feed my females shortly after giving birth, often the next day, because they're very hungry. They have put a lot of energy into making these babies and they'll usually feed voraciously um, after giving birth. I give them a rodent that's a little smaller, like one size smaller than they normally get. So that right there is my boa breeding process in a nutshell. As I mentioned, this isn't the only way to do it, but it's what I found has worked for me. I hope this has been somewhat helpful and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. If you like this video and you haven't already subscribed to the Brian Boas YouTube channel, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe. Thank you for your attention and remember to enjoy your Boas.